we've been talking about Darcy's law relative permeability and fractional flow. One thing is, is that uh, we introduced the multi-phase form of Darcy's law. And in this equation, we remember that U is the Darcy velocity. It's the flow rate divided by the cross-sectional area. In three dimensions, it can be a vector. In one dimension, it's just a scalar. The subscript J indicates the phase. So if we have two phases, oil and water, J could be O for oil, W for water. If we had a third phase gas, then you could have UG. So every phase is its own velocity. The velocity looks like Darcy's law. Uh, we've got it in the most general form, though. So what we have is we've got a permeability tensor. This is true in three dimensions. If it's, iso if it's um, most of the time, we can declare that tensor as a diagonal tensor, so it's got an x, a y, and a z component. And if it's isotropic, or if it's 1D, then there's just one permeability k, and that's, that's a scalar. Grad pj is the um, pressure gradient of phase j, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. So it's a pressure gradient, so it's a, it's a pressure change over, uh, over a distance. Uh, rho, okay, and so that's what I've indicated there. It, it is a vector in three dimensions. In one dimension, it's just a scalar. Uh, H is the elevation. Elevation increases as you go up. So, so the top of a mountain has a positive elevation. A reservoir has a negative elevation. I don't like to use elevation. I like to use depth. And um, that's where the depth gradient comes in is that depth increases as you go deeper. So a reservoir below the earth's surface has a positive depth. And so I might refer to a reservoir as being five, a depth of 5,000 feet. Um, this phi is a potential, and a potential is basically a corrected pressure. So it's a pressure, gra or it's a, so the potential gradient is the pressure gradient minus the terms involving gravity. Um, what I mean corrected pressure, what I mean is that we're I shouldn't say a corrected pressure, but maybe a normalized pressure, one that's normalized by the gravity. And so, so if you think of um, a swimming pool or a reservoir that's got varying depths, under static conditions, they would have different pressures because as you go deeper, you've got uh, gravitational effects and, and the pressure's higher. But the potential would be the same everywhere under static conditions. And so one thing that I didn't mention yet, and I will later, is that KRJ is the relative permeability of phase J. In the 1D form, um, you can still have some sort of uh, gradient in your depth or elevation, but, um, but this is the 1D form, and U is a scalar now of phase J, K is a scalar, the permeability, and you only have one direction, and then this is the the sign of the angle, and we'll come back to that a little bit. And you can have it for each phase. And then we remember that relative permeability is a value between 0 and 1. It's nonlinear function of saturation, which I've shown over here. So this is the relative permeability versus the water saturation. And, and be, uh, I need to re-upload these slides. Um, be very careful about this. This is for a water-wet medium. This is oil and this is water. And I know this because for a water wet medium at the end point, the oil has a relatively large relative permeability and the water has a low relative permeability at its end point. And again, that's related to the non-wetting phase being in the big pores and the wetting phase being in the small pores. Okay, and then I've uh, described what some of these endpoints are. So you should be familiar with these curves and, and understand um, what these look like. And in fact, in your homework number four, I actually asked you to make some plots of that in, in, using Python. There are some empirical equations for relative permeability. The most commonly used is the Corey Brooks model, and it uses these endpoint values, KRW naught, KRO naught, and a normalized saturation S. Uh, the normalized saturation S is normalized by the residual water saturation and the residual oil saturation. NW and NO are exponents that are greater than 1, usually between 2 and 3. And those are things that you would either, you know, you would do some sort of curve fitting exercise to experimental data, or I would, you know, on an exam or homework, I'd more than likely provide that for you.
Okay, so um, if we go back to uh, multi-phase flow with gravity, this is um, the, the terms for water and oil. And um, notice that uh, we've got gravity, so we've got a density of water times G times the sine of the angle. And the other thing is that PW is not necessarily equal to PO. So the pressures at two phases could be different. The difference is the capillary pressure. Now we'll like to point out that many times and very, very frequently in this class, I will tell you to neglect capillary pressure, in which case PW is equal to PO is equal to P. Uh, we, we did a, some, some algebra there and we introduced this fractional flow. So what is the fractional flow? It's exactly what it sounds like. It's the fraction of the flow that is a particular phase. So Fj is the velocity of the phase divided by the total velocity. So Fw is the fractional flow of water and it's the water velocity divided by the total and Fo is U over U. Um, importantly, the sum of all phase velocities is equal to the total velocity. So if you have two phases, UW plus UO is equal to U. And, um, and then the sum of all the fractional flow terms is equal to one. So if you have two phases, FW plus FO is equal to one. One thing I'd like to point out, this is important, is that even though FW plus FO can equal to one, individually, they can be greater than one or less than zero. So FW could be 1.2 and FO could be minus 0.2, for example. They still add up to one. And I'll explain that a little bit more in a few moments, but, but that's because of gravity. Okay, and so what we did is we, we, we did some algebra and then we derived an equation for fractional flow. And, and many times we talk about the fractional flow of water. If it's two phases, then we know that the fractional flow of oil is just one minus FW. And the equation is, um, it looks a little complicated over here, um, but these are um, all things that we might know. So the K, the permeability, we have the relative permeabilities, which are a function of saturation. So at a given saturation, we can evaluate that. The viscosity of the oil and the water, the total velocity U, the gradient and capillary pressure. Again, that, that would be zero if, the, if capillary pressure is negligible. And then we've got this delta rho G sine alpha term, where delta rho is the density of water minus the density of oil, and sine of alpha, alpha is the dip angle. So, um, okay, so um, this can be simplified if capillary pressure is negligible and there's no gravitational effect, and you could write it like this. Okay, so it's a little bit simpler. Sometimes we write this, these write these as mobilities, where the mobility lambda of phase, um, I should have called it phase J, but I called it phase I here, is the permeability of that phase divided by the viscosity of that phase. Okay, and so here was a, again a relative permeability curve. Uh, the legend should have been switched again, so this is the oil relative permeability and this is the water relative permeability. And then over here what we have is a plot of the fractional flow versus water saturation. And this is what a typical plot looks like. So a typical plot looks like FW versus SW. Um, if the residual saturation over here was 0.2 of water, then that means that there are no water flows at 0.2 or lower. So that's why FW is zero because UW is zero. Then it increases, it has an inflection point. That's important, we'll talk about it more in a minute. And then when you get to the one minus the residual oil saturation, it looks like it's 0.8 over here, then all of a sudden the fractional flow of water is 100% or one because no oil is flowing, so it's 100% water. The other thing that we could do is we could take the derivative of this curve and we'll call that dfw dsw or fw prime and, um, and that's, of course, the slope of the line tangent to the curve. And so we'll introduce that in a few moments. We did talk about some uh, dimensionless variables, the mobility ratio, which is obviously the ratio of the mobilities. Then there's the endpoint mobility ratio, which is the mobilities ratio, but using the endpoint relative permeability. So when SW is equal to SWR and, and 1 minus SOR, 
Uh, and then we introduce a gravity number, which is a ratio of gravitational to viscosity effects. And if we do that, um, and we use our, our Cori model for uh, relative permeability, then you get this fractional flow equation in sort of a, a non-dimensional form. Um, and you could use that, that equation that way. And, and that's nice because then you could um, evaluate the, how things look at different mobility ratios. And so this is a plot of fractional flow of water versus SW. And this is at three different mobility ratios and a dip angle of zero. So if sine of alpha is zero, so this whole term goes away. Um, but, but this is what it would typically look like. So depending on what the mobility ratio is, and remember the mobility ratio is, the mobility is the relative permeability divided by the viscosity of that fluid, and so it's the ratio of those mobilities. Depending on the mobility ratio, at the same saturation, you can have a very different fractional flow. So clearly mobility ratio has a big impact. Okay, so one thing I'd really like to talk about is countercurrent flow. So depending on your pressure gradient, whether it's in the, the direction of flow or in the opposite direction of, of flow, uh, or the opposite direction of your, of your axes, then flow can be positive or negative. But on top of that, flow could be positive for one phase and negative for the other phase. So I could put a pressure gradient on a porous medium, and theoretically, or really more than theoretically, is that the oil could go in one direction and the water could go in the opposite direction. Okay, And what that means is that the fractional flow of the phases can be negative, less than zero, or they could be greater than one. Right? Because um, the fractional flow is the velocity of the phase divided by the total velocity. So if the total velocity is positive, but the velocity of, phase, of the water phase is negative, then you get a negative fractional flow. If you had a negative fractional flow of water, and that means you must have fractional flow of oil that's greater than one, because they have to add up to one. Okay, and so that's what I've I've shown there. And so if you make a plot of fractional flow of water versus SW, you could get a plot that looks like this. So depending on your gravity number, or your gravity number times the sine of your dip angle, you might get something like this. So if the dip angle is zero, then clearly you get something like that. But if gravital, gravitational forces are really large, are really large compared to the viscous forces, your, your pressure gradient forces, then, then you start getting these effects where fractional flow can be greater than one as it is there, and it could be less than zero as it is over here in this range. Okay, that's when your dip angle is positive or negative. Now let me talk about that a, a little bit more. Um, does that make sense? Why can the phases, why can they go in the opposite directions? Well again, it's because of gravity, okay? And you have to remember that water is usually, one of the phases is more dense than the other one, and it's almost always water that's more dense than oil. And so if you don't put very much force, if you don't put a lot of pressure gradient on it, and then the phases will, will separate in a way to where the denser phase goes to the bottom and the less dense phase comes to the top. So think about this. Let's say you had a, a rock core. Let's say it's a one foot long rock core. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to borrow this right over here. This will be my paper towels. Pretend this is a porous medium right here. Okay. And let's say we've got, we got uh, water and oil saturated in here. Okay, and it's like this. And all of a sudden, I turned it upside down. Okay, so it's where it's vertical. Okay, well, what would happen? Okay, if everything, the water and the oil were evenly distributed over here, and I turned it upside down, and I just let gravity do its thing, then the oil would go, de would go up, it's less dense, and the water would go down. So the velocity of the water is the opposite direction of the oil. Now, if I put just a little bit of pressure gradient in this direction, from the bottom to the top, maybe that wouldn't change much. Is that water still kind of goes to the bottom and oil still kind of goes to the top. If I put a whole lot of pressure gradient on there, then it overwhelms the gravitation, and then both water and oil would both be moving in this direction, right? If I put enough force on it, then everything's going to be moving over there. It'll overcome the gravitational force.
And, but, but that's why sometimes you can get negative uh, fractional flows or greater than one. And again, it's due to the different densities. Um, so countercurrent flow, um, water um, is possible, water and oil flow in opposite directions. I'd like to point out that this equation right here is all dimensionless, so it makes it unitless. All of those terms, ng naught, s, alpha, m naught, they're all dimensionless. So if you use this form, then it would be, but, but you probably won't use that form. You might use um, this form over here. So the question is, is that, uh, you know, what units do you use? You just have to, you're going to have to do some unit conversions there. And so K is in millidarcies, but that's really a length squared. Viscosity, well, first off, this term right here is dimensionless, right? Because the viscosity of water, the viscosity of oil, those units cancel, and then these are dimensionless. So the only ones you have to worry about are over here. And this has got units of length squared or, or millidarcies. This has got units of length per time. This has got units of pressure time. Centipoise is, is like Pascal seconds. And this is a pressure versus length. And if you do all that, then they should cancel. But, but you, you're right. If you use millidarcies and centipoise, you'll have to do a unit conversion there. In my favorite unit conversion, and go look it up on the equation sheet, is 6.33 times 10 to the minus 3, which converts millidarcies centipoise foot into, um, into the right unit. So um, you just have to be careful with your unit conversions. So I have one, well, okay, I'll just go through this last slide and then I'll complete the example problem we did last time. So uh, this is the fractional flow curve, FW versus SW. Remember, in the absence of any gravity or if gravity is small compared to the pressure gradient or viscous forces, then you get this kind of monotonic increase that looks like this. But if gravitational forces are, are large, you could get this greater than one or, or less than one. This is fractional flow versus water saturation. And what we'll find in the next chapter, chapter, um, is it gonna be chapter 13, is that we might also need the derivative of fractional flow. So the FW prime or DFW DSW. And the derivative is the slope of the line tangent to the curve. So what you'd have to do is you have to take the slope of all these points and so if this is FW, then, um, then you have to do DFW, DSW. Now, you could do that analytically, although that's hard to do, and you're going to have to do this for your homework number four. Um, let me just show you quickly how I would do that. Let's say you wanted to know FW prime, which is equal to DFW, DSW, at a particular saturation, right? So let's say SW is equal to 0.5, and I want to know the derivative at 0.5. Um, rather than doing that analytically, you can use finite differences. So you could say FW at S is equal, w is equal to 0.51 minus FW at SW is equal to 0.5 divided by 0.51 minus 0.5. Okay. Um, that was arbitrary to use 0.51. Maybe it would have been better if I used 0.501. Okay, and that would be, um, because remember, the derivative is the slope of the line tangent to the curve. And so this is a slope, right? It's a rise over a run, and it's really a secant, not a tangent. And so the closer I get to those values, I'll do that. Now, you wouldn't want to use 0.50001, because then you'd, you'd get, like, round off error and, and all that. And this is a a more than a good enough approximation, I think. But this is how you can get that derivative, and I asked for that on the on the homework. Okay, so going back to this, so so that's how we would calculate it. Now, what does the curve look like? Okay, well, remember the fractional flow goes from zero to over here, and the slope. I mean, you could just look at it, and you could tell that it's going to be zero right there. It's going to be zero right there, and it's going to be maximum somewhere in between. And so if you were to plot the derivative at all saturations, you'll get something that looks like this. You'll get, you'll get kind of a, a peak, right? So at the residual saturations, in this case it was 0.2 and 
you get zero, and then somewhere in between you reaches a maximum and it goes the other way. And so this is characteristic of most fractional flow curves and uh, it is important and we will revisit that. So what I did is I asked some questions. So I gave you relative permeability, Corey Brooks parameters, I gave you the viscosities of the fluid, I said that the dip angle is zero degrees and it's saturated with oil and water. And then I asked, um, would you describe this as water, intermediate, or oil wet? We said it's water wet because the endpoint relative permeability of oil is greater than water. Um, then I asked in part B and C, what are the relative permeabilities and fractional flows at a particular saturation? And those two saturations were at the endpoint. So when SW is 0.2 and SW is 0.7, that made it to where I didn't have to do any calculations. The relative permeabilities were equal to zero and the endpoint values respectively, and the fractional flows were zero and one respectively. But then part C was a little bit more complicated. I gave you a saturation of, um, or I should say part D was more complicated. Um, and so what I did is I said, okay, if the water saturation is 50%, what is the relative permeability of water and oil? What is the mobility ratio? What is the fractional flow of water and oil? What is the velocity of water oil in total? So this one was more complicated. And remember, you know, we've got some sort of relative permeability curve that looks like this. It's water wet, so this is going to be water, this is going to be oil, and we're somewhere like over here, right? And so I want to know what KRW is and what KRO is, and, and they're going to be different, and you have to use an equation to solve for that. So we did that, I think we did that last time. So what we had to do is calculate the normalized saturation S. So SW is 0.5. We were given the water and oil residual saturation, so we calculated S as 0.6. Then we plug that into our Cori parameters, and what we learn is that KRW is 0.072 and KRO is 0.16. Now both of those numbers are less than one and they add up to less than one and that's what we expect. And they're pretty small values. Okay, So that was the first question. What's the relative permeability of water? What's the relative permeability of oil? The next question was what is the mobility ratio? Now don't confuse that with the endpoint mobility ratio. The mobility ratio is KRW times mu O over KRO times mu W. And so that was 0.072 times the viscosity of oil divided by the relative permeability of oil times the viscosity of water, and we get 0.9. Okay, so that's 0.9. Now m dot m naught would have been KRW naught mu o KRO naught mu W, which would have been what? That's going to be KRW was. 0.2 times 2. KRO was 1 times 1, so that would have been 0.4. So the endpoint mobility ratio is 0.4, but the, the mobility ratio at a saturation of 50% is 0.9, and that's what we had asked for. Okay, so um, next. Um, uh, the next question is, what is the fractional flow of water and oil? So we got to use our fractional flow equation. Okay, so I'm just going to, we got 10 minutes, I think I'm going to work through this. So um, the, the question is, what's the fractional flow of water? FW is 1 plus K, KRO, total velocity, viscosity of the oil, times DPC, DX, minus delta rho, that's the density of the um, difference in density between the water and the oil, G 
sine of alpha divided by 1 over krw mu w over kro mu o. Oh, I'm sorry, you can't see that. So now you can see it. Okay, and I'd like to point out that this is equal to 1 over the mobility ratio we've already calculated. Now in the problem statement, we say that the pressure, that, that uh, capillary pressure can be neglected, so that's zero. And we also say that the sine of the, the dip angle is zero and the sine of zero is zero, so we can neglect that. And then FW is equal to one over one plus one over M, which is equal to one over one divided by 0.9. If you plug that in, you get 0.473. And FO is equal to 1 minus 0.473, which is equal to 0.517, excuse me. Okay. Now, both of those numbers, they, they obviously add up to 1. In this case, they're both greater than 0 and less than 1. I expected that because I don't have any gravitational effects. If I did have gravitational effects, it's possible, it's not definite, but it's possible I could add a negative fractional flow or a positive fractional flow. And if I did that, I would have had to have done this. So remember delta rho is going to be rho water minus the rho oil, which um, is going to be in units of um, pounds force per cube, pounds mass per cubic foot. Okay. And then I got to multiply that by G. And then multiply by the sine of the angle. Now I'm going to give you a, 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 a secret here on how to do this. So you got to be very careful with your units because um, delta rho is in pounds mass per cubic foot. G is in feet squared per second. Um, and, and, and you have to do that unit conversion there. But delta rho... G is equal to delta rho in units of pounds mass per cubic foot like it's given divided by 144 and that be, that's because there's 144 square inches per square foot and this is and, and this will give you a value in psi per foot okay which is what we want this in, we want that in, in, in those units. So um, you should have done this before in previous classes, probably in your drilling class, certainly in reservoir engineering. But um, do know, make sure you know how to do that because you got to put everything in the right units. The other thing is, is that um, there was a question about units before. This K is probably in milliDRCs, this mu is in centipoise, so you'll have to do a unit conversion to make everything dimensionless. But just work through that. In our problem, we didn't have to worry about that, though, okay? Because the sine of the dip angle is zero um, over here. The capillary pressure is zero, so the derivative of capillary pressure is zero, et cetera. Now, there's one last thing we have to do is we have to calculate the velocities of the water, the oil, and, um, and the total. So mu w is minus krw over mu w times K times the pressure gradient, which is dpdx, yeah, plus the density of water, G, times the sine of alpha. Okay, and this is all given to us. Okay. So sine of alpha is obviously zero because alpha is zero. DPDX, the pressure gradient was given as one PSI per foot. Permeability and everything in there. So what we have is um, relative permeability is minus 0.072. K is 100 millidarcies. Mu W is one centipoise. Pressure gradient is one PSI per foot. 
and I got to do my conversion factor, which is that one that I talked about, 10, 10 to the minus 3. Centipod, poised foot, millet RC, PSI. So all this cancels out. And you get... It double check that this is correct. I got to put that in, but, but this basically gives you feet per day. Okay, so I get mu w is minus 0 0.0456 feet per day, and it's important that I got a negative sign there. Now, why do I have a negative sign? Well, there is a negative in front of over here, and you know, I really wish on this example problem I'd have been a little bit more clear about the pressure gradient but it was one PSI per foot. So I, I didn't say it was negative, I said it was positive. And what does a positive pressure gradient mean? Okay, this is zero, this is L, this is P in, this is P out. Okay, and this is, this is a positive X direction. Okay, so dp dx, is equal to P out minus P in divided by L minus zero. So if this is positive, like one PSI per foot, that must mean that P out, must mean that P out is greater than P in. That means flow is going in the absence of gravity that way. So that's why we get a negative velocity. Okay, and if you do this problem over here, I'll just show you the results. So what you get is a negative 0.0456 feet per day. By the way, um, I, I, I accidentally before put in the solution to this and I didn't mean to put in the solution, and the solution actually had some errors, so um, make sure you use what I have now, and I've re-uploaded the example problem without the solution on Canvas. But this is a negative. The total velocity is gonna be negative, which is UW divided by FW. So that's negative 0.0963, and the viscosity of the, the velocity of the oil is the total velocity times the fractional flow of oil. So that's negative 0.0963 times the fractional flow, which is 0.527, and I get 0.0508, um, negative 0.0508. So in this case, velocity of the water, the total velocity, and the oil velocity are all negative. That's because the pressure gradient is going in the opposite direction. That's why I have one positive one PSI per foot. If I had negative one PSI per foot, it would be going in, they, they would all have positive velocities. But if I had gravity, if I had gravity and, and the pressure gradient was small compared to gravity, then you could have the water velocity and the oil velocity be opposite signs. One could be positive and one could be negative. 